Okay, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. This is Trump Week here on a given Wednesday. We really like this show because it follows the action in Washington. And let me tell you, if you don't already know, the action in Washington affects every single one of us. Tim Apicella, our co-host, uh, helps us understand these issues and events. Hi, Tim. Welcome to Trump Week. Good morning, Jay. Thank you very much for having me. And um, another busy week. Yeah, another busy week. You know, it's like... You know, the whole affair in Iran, um, you know, with the assassination and then the attack on the American bases there, it seems like ages ago, so much has happened. It's, this, is, this is the best reality show ever in the world because there's no, no moment where something new isn't happening to distract us from the real issues. So, Tim, what are the real issues right now this week? Well, I, I think that... A, a big issue is the, um, the credibility gap with uh, President Trump, uh, specifically when we're trying to find what constitute or what defined an imminent threat um, that was required to take the assassination and um, take him out. So what was the imminent threat? Now, we've heard so many different uh, stories. We've heard back, backtracking. We've got... Um, Secretary of Defense, not on the same page as Donald Trump. Was it one embassy that was in an imminent threat, or was it four embassies that was going to be attacked? Which is it? Or was there any of them? Uh, was it just a generalized threat that Donald Trump felt it necessary to call it an imminent threat? Uh, let me ask you a rhetorical question. If this president, over three years plus, thousand days plus has lied 15,000 times can you think of a good reason why he's telling the truth now well I didn't use the term credibility gap for nothing yeah I you know my guess is he's not telling the truth one very interesting piece of evidence came out there's some evidence of the proposition that uh, he had approved this assassination seven months ago and presumably it's not legal unless there was an imminent threat so Let's assume there was an imminent threat um, seven months ago. Do you think the threat would still be imminent a week ago? Would it be the same threat? Would it be different? And why didn't he advise Congress at any point along the way? This is a sole proprietorship type of government we have here. And more and more, you see this president doing it all by himself, spending all his time at Mar-a-Lago, playing golf with Lindsey Graham, one of my unfavorite persons, um, and in, in general, gutting uh, all his departments. He hasn't appointed people. Uh, even FEMA does not have a, a, a proper director. Um, and uh, there are so many agencies, and especially the State Department, where he has essentially turned his back on them, and they, they're unstaffed now. You can walk through the halls of the Department of State and nobody there. Uh, and we have people who have been there who have told us that. It's very interesting. So what you have is a sole proprietorship government, uh, and he makes these decisions all by himself. And he lies you know, 15,000 times. Uh, so where are we now on Iran? Let's assume that um, he's going to double down on every lie. Uh, let's assume that he keeps going the way he's going. Where are we, in fact, on Iran? Well, are, is anyone surprised that the House of Representatives has created a resolution that will curtail his ability to wage war, to start war? Um, and it sounds like there's going to be enough senators um, that will actually go for it. Yeah. That they, there's like two or three that will actually uh, vote for it. Um, so, so are we surprised this is happening? No, we're not. Well, but the Senate will never adopt that resolution. It's only uh, in the House, and it's again the ever-ready bunny running into the corner of the room. It's well, not, it's uh, not going Kane, anywhere. Kim Kane says he's got three or four senators. Get them over 51. Now, if it goes to Donald Trump, he'll, of course, veto it, most likely, and there won't be enough votes to override the veto. But I think it will go to his desk from the Senate. Well, that would be good to control him because, uh, you know, it is an existential threat that he assassinates uh, leaders of other states and risks uh, a conflagration that would, only, that would go beyond the Middle East, that would go other places and create a, a, a world war. It's all reminiscent of, uh, of the Guns of August by Barbara Tuckman, where you had these uh, programmed responses um, to violence, like the assassination of the Archduke of, of Serbia, where all of a sudden you find that uh, this, this one event created a world war. 
And you never know when you use violence, you never know what happens. Uh, so it's, it's of great concern, and hopefully it's of concern to some of those uh, Republican senators. And, of course, that's linked, isn't it? The, the, uh, the credibility, uh, the, the support, the loyalty of those Republican senators is really at issue these days. I mean, it's hard to believe, is it not, that these Republican senators uh, put their loyalty to Trump above all other interests of the nation. Uh, very, very, uh, very concerning. Uh, so the, the question is, uh, what is going on with the trial? Uh, just today, uh, was it, uh, Nancy Pelosi announced her uh, managers, her Senate trial managers, including, uh, who is it, uh, I guess it's Adam Schiff and, and Schumer, um, to be oh, the Jerry manager. Nadler. Jerry Nadler. Uh, Nad you're right, Nadler. Um, and now we're going to have a trial probably starting next Wednesday. And if uh, Mitch McConnell has his way, it'll, be, it'll last six minutes and result in a fast acquittal without witnesses. But th that does depend on a vote of, of the Senate. And maybe we'll have, um, you know, more senators, uh, you know, um, get, get sober. Um, so anyway, what, what is the status of that? Where is well, that going right now? Well, first off, Gary, um, I think she's appointed seven different uh, managers which includes, of course, Adam Schiff and Jerry Nadler. Uh, but the other five, they're well-versed in litigation and well-versed in, you know, experience and time in the courtroom. So she's not bringing in a philosophical point of view. She's bringing in a, um, a litigation strategy as they present this to the Senate. So you know, that's, I think that's interesting. Just Monday, I think it was, additional evidence came into the public view um, that, that is really damning evidence of uh, notes written by Lev Parnas, I think, uh, Giuliani's uh, associate, um, where he says uh, that, that uh, they, want, um, they want Zelensky, the president wants Zelensky uh, to, um, uh, I forget the exact terms, but, uh, oh, announce an investigation uh, into Biden. Uh, Correct. And, uh, the, you know, this, this, is, this is damning. This is a smoking gun. And there are many documents like that that have just been revealed. Uh, I guess they came out of a, a response to requests for documents that was pending a long time ago, and nobody noticed them. Or uh, now they've, been, they've had the time to look through thousands of documents and found these things. And these are going to be submitted. I think they may already have been submitted to the Senate. And so even if they, you know, weren't in the original tranche of documents, they're certainly going to be available directly or by way of the media to every member of the Senate. How does this change things, if at all, Tim? Well, I think the more you get in, in front of the senators during this trial, be it direct witnesses or documents, uh, texts, emails, the harder it is for them to ignore it because everyone's going to be looking at it. And it's not like this is, um, you know, evidence pre presented behind closed doors as if it was a grand jury. This will be open to the public. And so for them to look at it and continue to ignore it, it's going to be more difficult. That's why Donald Trump didn't want to have any witnesses, didn't want to have any testimony, he didn't want to have any documents. So he, they have, would have nothing to respond to. You know, I was, uh, not to get too far off the point, but I was watching... Uh television last night and uh, interestingly enough that the movie that won I don't know how many Academy Awards the night week before uh, is called uh, Clown I'm sorry make that Joker Joker and it's a story it's a story about a guy who happens to be psychotic um, and it has you know it has some interesting connections and the use of words and names uh, to you know the original uh, Batman Joker but it's not that at all. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out why it won all those awards, but it's the story of a, a psychotic man who his occupation is being a clown. Um, and he, he, he devolves into a, a, a murderer uh, and some tremendous violence. I mean, really shocking violence in this movie. But I kept thinking of this whole process that you and I have talked about before. It goes back to the article about uh, Dr. Frank uh, where he wrote for the New York Times um, that um, he felt that Trump was a psychotic. And the thing about psychotics is they don't stay the same. They're not static. 
they move, they, they have a dynamic, they get worse. Uh, unless they take their medicine, they get worse. It's the story of this movie, uh, how he got worse. But you know, when you see all these things happening, you wonder if we are seeing a process, a dynamic, where Trump is getting worse, more lies, more outrageous things, more um, things that are you know, mean and nasty and undermine the Constitution. Um, what do you think about that? You, are we seeing this dynamic? We are seeing a dynamic, and it's not just a matter of now undermining the Constitution. We're now starting to undermine international law, and that is wars of crime. Or excuse me, crimes, crimes that involve war, and that specifically is you can't just start assassinating, you know, sovereign states and say that this is not a portion of war. Um, there's some, you know, there's there's some wiggle room there, and the wiggle room is the term imminent threat. But we know we're pretty sure that um, the assassination of of this general was not imminent. He was not an imminent threat. Was he a bad guy? Absolutely. Did he deserve to be hit? taken out absolutely was it the right time to do it absolutely not it was not the right time to take them out certain administrations certainly had their opportunities and they chose not to do it for a reason and so we don't want this president who's starting to devolve get us into a war and and that's why i think you see this resolution that's going to be presented by tim Kaine. um i think we'll see it pass and, and then it'll go to to the house you know, I think we'll pass there too. Yesterday with John David and a history professor at HPU, we, uh, we reviewed the history of the relationship between the U.S. and Iran from back in the early part of the 20th century. And, you know, it started out uh, as an oil relationship, and, and oil really defines Iran. It defines its economy and all that. And then we did some things. Uh, there was a fellow named Mossadegh, and, and he was the, 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 the popular leader of Iran, I guess, in the 50s. And... The U.S. brought him down, um, sort of like the Iran-Contra controversy with Oliver North. The U.S. was manipulating, um, you know, in matters of government in Iran under the hood. And we did things that offended, the, offended most people in Iran. And they began to really dislike us with cause, with cause. And then, you know, of course, with Jimmy Carter, the, all those people were held hostage in the American embassy, 52 of them. Trump reminds us it was 52 of them. Um, and we've been on a bad footing ever since with Iran. On the other hand, you know, uh, and I'd like your opinion on this. On the other hand, Iran, erroneously, in a sort of a paranoid kind of way, shot down, uh, intentionally shot down, not a mistake. They intentionally shot down uh, the Ukrainian airliner and then said, oh, we didn't mean to, uh, but they meant to, they meant to shoot something down and they shot it down successfully with two missiles. Um, you know, with, with dead-on accuracy. And so, you know, they're embarrassed now, and they, they say they're going to prosecute a number of people. They've already arrested and, you know, started uh, that prosecution. We don't know who the people are. But you know what? It's similar to the fact that the U.S. shot an Iranian uh, plane down uh, some years ago. And, and, uh, uh, and, and a lot of people were killed on that one. Um, I I think we apologized. Uh, we did not apologize, but they apologized for the one that went down last week. So I, I raise all this because somehow, you know, somehow it's a kindred event. Somehow we have the problem, they have the problem. We handle it differently perhaps than they do. But the fact is they're a modern, uh, very near Western kind of community in Iran. They just happen to have a theocracy that messes things up, in my opinion. So the question, the question I put to you is, um, are we kindred to the point where, under the hood, we could establish a, a peaceful relationship, a camaraderie even, with, with Iran? Or is it always going to be like this? Well, that's a good question. And I think what comes to my mind is Donald Trump's, you know, shifting from one side to another as far as how he feels about Iran. Let's look at this uh, recent overtures from Donald Trump to the Iranian people, or specifically to the Ayatollah. And, and he said the following uh, to the leaders of Iran, do not kill protesters. Turn your internet back on and let reporters roam free. Stop killing the great Iranian people. So here's a you know, juxtaposition. In one second, he wants to go to war with the Iranian people. 
and he did so by killing the, one of the second in command of, 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 the, of the country of Iran. And then in two or three days later, he's pleading to, <clears throat> to the Ayatollahs that uh, the Iranian people need to be free as they are in the United States. I don't get it. I don't understand this juxtaposition back and forth, and it's for convenience sake, or he really has some organic issues going on. Well, it's like when he gets up and makes these, you know, long speeches, like up to two hours, and he dissembles all over the place and you know, rambles in, in every direction and just uses epithets and, and, and words that he thinks will achieve an emotional result. Uh, and I'm reminded, uh, you know, while the uh, articles are going from the House to the Senate, he's out there in Wisconsin having this huge um, theatrical um, uh, choreographed uh, 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 rally. He does that all the time in, in the name of uh, he's running for president. It doesn't matter about the impeachment. And in, in those rallies, <clears throat> he makes all kinds of comments about his uh, purported adversaries, and, uh, and he tries to shore up his position on all these uh, horrendous mistakes that he's made in the recent past, well, all through his, all through his uh, administration. And so what we have is um, this kind of huge disconnect. Uh, and there they are, tens of thousands of people surrounding him, holding signs that support him, tens of thousands of people cheering at his every word. What is going on in this country? Is he, does he really have that kind of support? I, I find it extraordinary more and more. I, I, I'm glad you brought that up to you because um, recently, Donald Trump tweeted an image of Nancy Pelosi in um, a hijab um, and Chuck Schumer in a turban. Now, he did this for a purpose. And under the picture, it says the corrupt, the corrupt damned trying to come to the Ayatollah rescue. And what is he doing that for? He's trying now to castigate Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, as Muslims. And in Donald Trump's world means, if you're a Muslim, you must be a terrorist. And why does he take that tap? Well, because 38% of his loyal base buys into that. Well, if you're a Muslim, you must be a terrorist. And this is crazy. This is, this is the president of the United States basically castigating an, an entire religion as terrorists. Yeah. And it's got to stop. It's got to stop. Well, who's stopping him? You know, it's hard to stop the man. Uh, you know, the president does have uh, some influence by virtue of his title. There was a very interesting um, uh, segment, I think it was on PBS, I think it was last night, where um, the cameraman, uh, the interviewer, was approaching people on the street in, in middle America, Wisconsin, Iowa, I don't remember which one. And um, it, it appears that Trump has encouraged um, people to report those who have beards, Tim. Beards. If you have a beard, somehow you are a threat uh, to, to the country, to our democracy. A beard. And, and it, was, it was the most amazing thing, amazing thing, because they, they approached a lot of people who happened to be uh, Trumpers. And they asked them, you know, what do you think about this beard thing? You know, would you report somebody who had a beard? Would you want people with beards to be reported? It was it a was ridiculous tongue-in-cheek question. And yet great majority, if not almost all of them in this, in this segment said, uh, yeah, you know, people with beards are dangerous for the country and we have to make the country safe. And there was one guy who said that who had a beard, which I thought was, was really odd. <laughs> I'm sorry, to, I'm, not, I'm, I'm losing my composure here because what you're saying is absolutely absurd. Um, I know for a fact that he had a, an issue with John Bolt mustache but I didn't know you now had a, um, you know, some real fundamental problems with people with beards. You better tell that to a lot of millennials and a lot of uh, Gen Z folks because a lot of them wear beards. We're all in trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> you can see all those guys running back to their homes and shaving right away. Yeah, but this is, but this is you. where he is. This is where he is. And you know, is that is that is that sane? Is yeah. that is that a moderated? Is that a president speaking? Let's kind of do a, just a summary, a quick summary of the old hits, if you will, the, the golden oldies of hits of Donald Trump, because the Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer um, dressing them up as, as terrorists because they're wearing Islamic garb 
And, you know, obviously with the photo, you know, that photo was doctored. And so he loves that kind of stuff. But what, you know, what have we been through? Well, remember the Muslims were banned from this country. We had a Muslim ban. And then remember he called anyone who had a problem with it as un-American or treasonous. And then remember he said, if you are a critic of these things, you're human scum. And then you have the image of him beating CNN. Um, you remember that, that logo of CNN being beaten as if it was a wrestling match. And then we have Hillary, Hillary Clinton being hit with a golf ball hard. Uh, then we have you know minority congressmen being told, go back to, from where you came from. And then we had neo-Nazis and, and, and the KKK in Charlottesville being compared to as fine people on both sides. So the list of deplorable um, overtures continues to expand, continues yes. to grow. And unfortunately, our Senate, who, who should be the break on this kind of activity, are mum, they're deaf, they're, they're silent of this thing. And, and why, why, what, what gain do they get by allowing the presidency this office, of, you know, this prestige office of the, the, one of the greatest countries in the world to be disintegrated and denigrated in our very, in our very eyes. I don't understand it. No, it's hard to understand. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dark, dark, unpleasant thing that we find this exists in our country after all these years. Years of, um, you know, diversity, years of kindness, years of acceptance and tolerance. Now we find we have this in a substantial number of people, millions of people get behind this. A lot, in my opinion, a lot of what Trump is doing is racist, uh, misogynist, <clears throat> and people support it. That's the, that's the essence, in my opinion, of his base. What's going on here? But let's, uh, let's look at who, who can say something. We have the Democrats. Um, and my next question to you is a hard question. You better sit down for this one. How well are they doing in these debates? How well are they doing in responding? Or are they just fighting among themselves? Are they gonna, they have a chance to win against this, this solo proprietorship, sole proprietorship uh, president? Of course they have a chance to win. The question is, can they put it together in order to win? And I, I, I was happy to see that the, the, um, the Warren, Bernie Sanders conflict didn't blow up any further on during one stage than it, the time was given to it. Uh, I thought that was going to go on for five or 10 minutes, this conflict between the two about an alleged statement that Bernie Sanders said that women, you know, they could never win. And um, you know, that, that whole thing was blown up way out of proportion. Stay on the moment on that, on the moment on that, uh, Stephen Colbert really, really had it right last night. He said, this is not a matter of he said, she said, it's he said, she said, he said, she said, but he didn't say it, and she says she said it, and you know he was he was really hysterical about this. But you know it was a tempest in a teapot. Is that an issue? Is that matter? Uh, what what they said about it, how they feel about it. Fact is, it's going to be very hard for a woman to win a presidency, either the nomination or the or the presidency. Um, it's going to be very hard. I, I you know if he said that, I would not disagree with him about it. And, you know, the problem is we're, so we're going to spend our time arguing about what he said and whether it's right or wrong about women. Um, that's not the issue. The issue is so many, it's so many other things. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm very concerned that Democrats don't present well and the press takes advantage like raw meat. They made a big, you say it was a small thing. They made a big thing out of it well, last that's night. Point. That's it that's defined point. this debate. And I'm saying, wait a minute, is this really what this, this, this race is about? Well, let's talk about some of the other issues. You were going to talk about them. Well, I think the one that concerns me the most is how Donald Trump is once again controlling the narrative for the Democrats. And they've got to stop doing that. We've got to get the Democrats got to get the narrative on the impeachment trial. That's one. And they've got to get the control of the narrative on the issues going forward for the 2020 election. And if they don't get those two things under control, once again, Donald Trump controls the airwaves and, you know, not only controls his base, but he now he's getting, he's digging into the independent vote. Um, just to do a side, slight uh, turnoff here on this issue, is I was speaking to a, a, a confirmed independent voter. And I, I asked him the questions about all the deplorable things that have taken place in the last three years with Donald Trump. And he acknowledged each and every one of them. 
and he knows them that they were deplorable, horrible, horrible things that the president has de either done by policy or in words. And I said, then why? Why are you now supporting him? You're an independent. Why Why are you tending to support Donald Trump at this time? Good question. And he said, my 401k has been better than ever. And it comes down to that. What do you say? And that's the silo thing, you know? I'm doing fine. I do not care about the rest of the country. I do not care if people are starving in the street. I do not care that they're dying of opioids. It's my interest, Uberalis. And I am very concerned about that because it represents a shift in the American culture. There was a time after World War II where it seemed to me that everybody cared about everybody else. It was a, a, a community of a, of a nation. We're in this together. In We're it in this together. together. We, need to, we need to care for each other. And that was what distinguished the United States from so many other countries. We care about each other. Well, clearly, when they answer the question that way, my 401k is doing fine, my business is doing fine, my taxes have been only modest, modestly reduced, but reduced, um, they're really talking about themselves, not the next guy. They don't want to help the next guy. Uh, this is very troubling, and it is, uh, it's emblematic of the moral failure or decline of this, of this country. Well, and I suspect, I suspect it's, this is affecting the senators in the Senate, is my interest. Now, maybe it's not their 401k that they're more concerned about. For the senators, it's my ability not to be primaried out by Donald Trump picking a, a candidate against me, and I get to keep my job as a senator. So, again, self-interest, and, and for many Americans, maybe it is the fact that their 401k has looked better than ever. I have a problem with that because I thought, I agree with you, I thought the me generation stopped in the 1980s. Well, apparently it's alive and well. Well, you know, though, I mean, I've had this conversation with a number of people who are so excited that their 401ks are doing well. <clears throat> but this president has the, the power, the sole proprietorship power, without consultation, <clears throat> by beating up his, uh, his, uh, his, his secretaries of one thing or another and, and the Fed. Uh, of ruining the economy in, a, in, a, in one tweet. He could do it, and he may do it without thinking thoughtlessly, as most of his acts are. And in that case, you know, your 401k not going to look so good, and neither is the guy in the street that was interviewed, not going to look so good. In fact, the whole thing could collapse, uh, and there are those people who actually think it will collapse. So um, if for those people out there who feel that uh, they should measure their, um, their loyalty to Trump by uh, the level of their 401k, think again. Um, one good extreme storm uh, in climate change, which he continues to deny, uh, will bring us all down. And speaking, well, go ahead, we're about done. Okay, well, here's a conundrum. So many Americans, especially in the Midwest, um, they don't have the resources to really get involved with a 401k. They're living paycheck to paycheck. So if, if it is the 401k syndrome that Garners is so much loyalty to Donald Trump. What do we say about those individuals that aren't involved in the stock market, as 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 many other Americans are? What's their what's their tag of loyalty? Is it is it racism? Is it you know misogynism? Is it I don't know the, the fact that you like a strong man, a strong leader, and you just you know compliantly fall behind? I don't know. Well, but maybe we'll find out going forward, Tim, because we're going to do this every single week. We're going to do it next week. We're going to explore these things, connect the dots here on Trump Week. Thank you so much, Tim Apicella. Thank you very, very much. Aloha, and thanks for having me. Aloha. Sleep well.